Book Eight, Sections Five through Seven of Politics by Aristotle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Politics by Aristotle, translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Eight, Sections Five through Seven. Section Five. Concerning music, there are some questions which we have already raised. These we may now resume and carry further. And our remarks will serve as a prelude to this or any other discussion of the subject. It is not easy to determine the nature of music, or why any one should have a knowledge of it. Shall we say, for the sake of amusement and relaxation, like sleep or drinking, which are not good in themselves but are pleasant, and at the same time care to cease, as Euripides says? And for this end, men also appoint music and make use of all three alike: sleep, drinking, and music. To which some add dancing, or shall we argue that music conduces to virtue, on the ground that it can form our minds and habituate us to true pleasures, as our bodies are made by gymnastics to be of a certain character, or shall we say that it contributes to the enjoyment of leisure and mental cultivation, which is the third alternative? Now, obviously, youths are not to be instructed with a view to their amusement, for learning is no amusement, but is accompanied with pain. Neither is intellectual enjoyment suitable to boys of that age, for it is the end, and that which is imperfect cannot attain the perfect or end. But perhaps it may be said that boys learn music for the sake of the amusement, which they will have when they are grown up. If so, why should they learn themselves and not, like the Persian and Median kings, enjoy the pleasure and instruction which is derived from hearing others? For surely persons who have made music the business and profession of their lives. Will be better performers than those who practice only long enough to learn. If they must learn music on the same principle, they should learn cookery, which is absurd. And even granting that music may form the character, the objection still holds. Why should we learn ourselves? Why cannot we attain true pleasure and form a correct judgment from hearing others, like the Lacedaemonians? For they, without learning music, nevertheless can correctly judge, as they say, of good and bad melodies. Or again, if music should be used to promote cheerfulness and refined intellectual enjoyment, the objection still remains: Why should we learn ourselves instead of enjoying the performance of others? We may illustrate what we are saying by our conception of the gods, for in the poet Zeus does not himself sing or play on the lyre. Nay, we call professional performers vulgar. No freeman would play or sing unless he were intoxicated or in jest. But these matters may be left for the present. The first question is whether music is or is not to be a part of education. Of the three things mentioned in our discussion, which does it produce? Education or amusement or intellectual enjoyment? For it may be reckoned under all three and seems to share in the nature of all of them. Amusement is for the sake of relaxation, and relaxation is of necessity sweet, for it is the remedy of pain caused by toil. An intellectual enjoyment is universally acknowledged to contain an element, not only of the noble but of the pleasant, for happiness is made up of both. All men that agree that music is one of the pleasantest things, whether with or without songs, as Musaeus says, sing to mortals of all things the sweetest. Hence, and with good reason, it is introduced into social gatherings and entertainments, because it makes the hearts of men glad. So that on this ground alone we may assume that the young ought to be trained in it, for innocent pleasures are not only in harmony with the perfect end of life, but they also provide relaxation. And whereas men rarely attain the end, but often rest by the way and amuse themselves, not only with a view to a further end, but also for the pleasure's sake, it may be well at times to let them find a refreshment in music. It sometimes happens that men make amusement the end. For the end probably contains some element of pleasure, though not any ordinary or lower pleasure, but they mistake the lower for the higher, and in seeking for the one find the other, since every pleasure has a likeness to the end of action. For the end is not eligible for the sake of any future good, nor do the pleasures which we have described exist for the sake of any future good, but of the past. That is to say, they are the alleviation of past toils and pains. And we may infer this to be the reason why men seek happiness from these pleasures. 
but music is pursued not only as an alleviation of past toil, but also as providing recreation. And who can say whether, having this use, it may not also have a nobler one? In addition to this common pleasure, felt and shared by all, for the pleasure given by music is natural, and therefore adapted to all ages and characters, may not it also have some influence over the character and the soul? It must have such an influence if characters are affected by it, and that they are so affected is proved in many ways, and not least by the power which the songs of Olympus exercise. For beyond question they inspire enthusiasm, and enthusiasm is an emotion of the ethical part of the soul. Besides, when men hear imitations, even apart from the rhythms and tunes themselves, their feelings move in sympathy. Since then music is a pleasure, and virtue consists in rejoicing and in loving and hating a right, there is clearly nothing which we are so much concerned to acquire and to cultivate as the power of forming right judgments and of taking delight in good dispositions and noble actions. Rhythm and melody supply imitations of anger and gentleness, and also of courage and temperance, and of all the qualities contrary to these, and of the other qualities of character, which hardly fall short of the actual affections, as we know from our own experience, for in listening to such strains our souls undergo a change. The habit of feeling pleasure or pain at mere representations is not far removed from the same feeling about realities. For example, if any one delights in the sight of a statue for its beauty only, it necessarily follows that the sight of the original will be pleasant to him. The objects of no other sense, such as taste or touch, have any resemblance to moral qualities. In visible objects there is only a little, for there are figures which are of a moral character but only to a slight extent, and all do not participate in the feelings about them. Again, figures and colors are not imitations, but signs of moral habits, indications which the body gives of states of feeling. The connection of them with morals is slight, but in so far as there is any, young men should be taught to look, not at the works of Paulson, but at those of Polygnotus, or any other painter or sculptor who expresses moral ideas. On the other hand, even in mere melodies there is an imitation of character, for the musical modes differ essentially from one another, and those who hear them are differently affected by each. Some of them make men sad and grave, like the so-called mixolydian, others enfeeble the mind, like the relaxed modes, another again produces a moderate and settled temper, which appears to be the peculiar effect of the Dorian. The Phrygian inspires enthusiasm. The whole subject has been well treated by philosophical writers on this branch of education, and they confirm their arguments by facts. The same principles apply to rhythm. Some have a character of rest, others of motion, and of these latter again some have a more vulgar, others a nobler movement. Enough has been said to show that music has a power of forming the character and should therefore be introduced into the education of the young. The study is suited to the stage of youth, for young persons will not, if they can help, endure anything which is not sweetened by pleasure, and music has a natural sweetness. There seems to be in us a sort of affinity to musical modes and rhythms, which makes some philosophers say that the soul is a tuning, others that it possesses tuning. 6. And now we have to determine the question which has been already raised whether children should be themselves taught to sing and play or not. Clearly, there is a considerable difference made in the character by the actual practice of the art. It is difficult, if not impossible, for those who do not perform to be good judges of the performance of others. Besides, children should have something to do, and the rattle of Archytas, which people give to their children in order to amuse them and prevent them from breaking anything in the house, was a capital invention, for a young thing cannot be quiet. The rattle is a toy suited to the infant mind, and education is a rattle or toy for children of a larger growth. We conclude, then, that they should be taught music in such a way as to become not only critics, but performers. The question, what is or is not suitable for different ages, may be easily answered. Nor is there any difficulty in meeting the objection of those who say that the study of music is vulgar. We reply, one, in the first place, that they who are to be judges must also be performers, 
and that they should begin to practice early, although when they are older they may be spared the execution. They must have learned to appreciate what is good and to delight in it, thanks to the knowledge which they acquired in their youth. As to two, the vulgarizing effect which music is supposed to exercise, this is a question which we shall have no difficulty in determining. When we have considered to what extent free men who are being trained to political virtue should pursue the art, what melodies and what rhythms they should be allowed to use, and what instruments should be employed in teaching them to play, for even the instrument makes a difference. The answer to the objection turns upon these distinctions, for it is quite possible that certain methods of teaching and learning music do really have a degrading effect. It is evident, then, that the learning of music ought not to impede the business of riper years, or to degrade the body or render it unfit for civil or military training, whether for bodily exercises at the time or for later studies. The right measure will be attained if students of music stop short of the arts, which are practiced in professional contests, and do not seek to acquire those fantastic marvels of execution which are now the fashion in such contests, and from these have passed into education. Let the young practice even such music as we have prescribed, only until they are able to feel delight in noble melodies and rhythms, and not merely in that common part of music in which every slave or child and even some animals find pleasure. From these principles we may also infer what instruments should be used. The flute, or any other instrument which requires great skill, as, for example, the heart, ought not to be admitted into education, but only such as will make intelligent students of music or of the other parts of education. Besides, the flute is not an instrument which is expressive of moral character. It is too exciting. The proper time for using it is when the performance aims not at instruction, but at the relief of passions. And there is a further objection. The impediment which the flute presents to the use of the voice detracts from its educational value. The ancients, therefore, were right in forbidding the flute to youths and freemen, although they had once allowed it. For when their wealth gave them a greater inclination to leisure, and they had loftier notions of excellence, being also elated with their success, both before and after the Persian War, with more zeal than discernment, they pursued every kind of knowledge, and so they introduced the flute into education. At Lacedaemon there was a choragus who led the chorus with a flute, and at Athens the instrument became so popular that most freemen could play upon it. The popularity is shown by the tablet which Thrasippus dedicated when he furnished the chorus to Ecphantites. Later experience enabled men to judge what was or was not really conducive to virtue, and they rejected both the flute and several other old-fashioned instruments, such as the Lydian harp, the many-stringed lyre, the heptagon, triangle, sambuca, the like, which are intended only to give pleasure to the hearer, and require extraordinary skill of hand. There is a meaning also in the myths of the ancients, which tells how Athene invented the flute and then threw it away. It was not a bad idea of theirs that the goddess disliked the instrument because it made the face ugly. But with still more reason, may we say that she rejected it because the acquirement of flute playing contributes nothing to the mind, since to Athene we ascribe both knowledge and art. Thus, then, we reject the professional instruments and also the professional mode of education in music. And by professional we mean that which is adopted in contests, for in this the performer practices the art, not for the sake of his own improvement, but in order to give pleasure and that of a vulgar sort, to his hearers. For this reason the execution of such music is not the part of a freeman, but of a paid performer, and the result is that the performers all vulgarized, for the end at which they aim is bad. The vulgarity of the spectator tends to lower the character of the music, and therefore of the performers. They look to him, he makes them what they are, and fashions even their bodies by the movements which he expects them to exhibit. 7. We have also to consider rhythms and modes, and their use in education. Shall we use them all or make a distinction? And shall the same distinction be made for those who practice music with a view to education, or shall it be some other? Now we see that music is produced by melody and rhythm, and we ought to know what influence these have respectively on education, 
and whether we should prefer excellence in melody or excellence in rhythm. But as the subject has been very well treated by many musicians of the present day, and also by philosophers who have had considerable experience of musical education, to these we would refer the more exact student of the subject. We shall only speak of it now after the manner of the legislator, stating the general principles. We accept the division of melodies proposed by certain philosophers into ethical melodies, melodies of action, and passionate or inspiring melodies, each having, as they say, a mode corresponding to it. But we maintain further that music should be studied, not for the sake of one, but of many benefits. That is to say, with a view to, one, education, two, purgation. The word purgation we use at present without explanation. But when hereafter we speak of poetry, we will treat the subject with more precision. Music may also serve, three, for enjoyment, for relaxation, and for recreation after exertion. It is clear, therefore, that all the modes must be employed by us, but not all of them in the same manner. In education the most ethical modes are to be preferred, but in listening to the performances of others we may admit the modes of action and passion also. For feelings such as pity and fear, or, again, enthusiasm, exist very strongly in some souls, and have more or less influence over all. Some persons fall into a religious frenzy, whom we see as a result of the sacred melodies. When they have used the melodies that excite the soul to mystic frenzy, restored as though they had found healing and purgation. Those who are influenced by pity or fear, and every emotional nature, must have a like experience, and others in so far as each is susceptible to such emotions, and all are in a manner purged and their souls lightened and delighted. The purgative melodies, likewise, give an innocent pleasure to mankind. Such are the modes and the melodies in which those who perform music at the theatre should be invited to compete. But since the spectators are of two kinds, the one free and educated, and the other a vulgar crowd composed of mechanics, laborers, and the like, there ought to be contests and exhibitions instituted for the relaxation of the second class also and the music will correspond to their minds, for as their minds are perverted from the natural state, so there are perverted modes and highly strung and unnaturally colored melodies. A man receives pleasure from what is natural to him, and therefore professional musicians may be allowed to practice this lower sort of music before an audience of a lower type. But for the purposes of education, as I have already said, those modes and melodies should be employed which are ethical, such as the Dorian, as we said before, though we may include any others which are approved by philosophers who have a musical education. The Socrates of the Republic is wrong in retaining only the Phrygian mode along with the Dorian, the more so because he rejects the flute, for the Phrygian is to the modes what the flute is to musical instruments. Both of them are exciting and emotional. Poetry proves this, for Bacchic frenzy and all similar emotions are most suitably expressed by the flute, and are better set to the Phrygian than to any other mode. The dithyram, for example, is acknowledged to be Phrygian, a fact of which the connoisseurs of music offer many proofs, saying, among other things, that Philoxenes, having attempted to compose his missions as a dithyram in the Dorian mode, found it impossible and fell back by the very nature of things into the more appropriate Phrygian. All men agree that the Dorian music is the gravest and manliest, and whereas we say that the extreme should be avoided and the mean followed, and whereas the Dorian is a mean between the other modes, it is evident that our youth should be taught the Dorian music. Two principles have to be kept in view, what is possible, what is becoming, at these every man ought to aim. But even these are relative to age. The old, who have lost their powers, cannot very well sing the high-strung modes, and nature herself seems to suggest that their songs should be of the more relaxed kind. Wherefore the musicians likewise blame Socrates, and with justice, for rejecting the relaxed modes in education, under the idea that they are intoxicating, not in the ordinary sense of intoxication, for wine rather tends to excite men, but because they have no strength in them. And so, with a view also to the time of life when men begin to grow old, they ought to practice the gentler modes and melodies as well as the others, 
and further any mode such as the Lydian above all others appears to be, which is suited to children of tender age, and possesses the elements both of order and education. Thus it is clear that education should be based upon three principles, the mean, the possible, the becoming, these three. End of Book 8, Sections 5-7 through seven. Recording by Sibella Denton, Carrollton, Georgia End of Politics by Aristotle Translated by Benjamin Jowett